Um, welcome everyone to our second talk today, uh, which is going to be about blockchain. Uh, so we are very happy to welcome Kian Kang from uh, University of Sydney, who is physically uh, visiting Melbourne here, which is great. And yeah, he is currently a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney. So from 2016 to 2020, he was an assistant professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology and director of JD NGIT. ISCAS joined Blockchain Lab. Uh, before joining NGIT, uh, he was a postdoc at Cornell University, and his research spans broadly on theoretical and applied cryptography and blockchain technology. And uh, he won a few prestigious awards, including MIT Technical Review, 35 Chinese innovators under 35, uh, Google Faculty Award, and NGIT Research Award. And today, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, his talk is going to be about the Dumble Protocol family, making us on this consensus practical. Thank you. Thanks uh, a lot for the introduction. Uh, let me, is the voice working well? And uh, let me try the, the slide seems not moving. Uh, ah, okay. Ah, okay, so th this seems uh, more challenging than crypto. So uh, <laughs> uh, first a uh, disclaimer, and uh, for, for the cryptographers here, probably got, got frustrated because we lose the precious name of a crypto to some sp spooky guys. And uh, I'm with you, and I'm one of uh, crypto people uh, as well. Um, I totally feel the frustration, but uh, today I'm going to talk about another type of crypto. Uh, it's a... Uh, I'm very happy. Oh, first, thanks a lot for the invitation from Jiangshan. And I'm very happy to see a lot of old friends and uh, meet a bunch of new friends today. And uh, we're going to talk about our recent work on asynchronous consensus protocols, we call Dumbo protocol families. And so today, when we talk about blockchain, the situation is much better than like eight, seven years ago. When I try to talk to friends into doing serious things in blockchain, they might think, I'm trying to bring them into some Ponzi scheme. But today when the mass media comes into play, actually we see all kinds of mysterious char characterization, essentially to push to the another extreme, right? As probably you all see like uh, in the media every day, blockchains you can read, you can write, you can do whatever, all kinds of magic words. But at the end of the day, um, all this, any of the properties has to be enforced or realized by uh, technology, particularly, uh, solid uh, scientific things. So our group did uh, quite a, a lot of works over the years. And uh, from, from my personal like characterization, we divided blockchain into three core layers. Uh, of course, I mean, there are many, many more layers. This is just my personal biased opinion. So first, the, the top layer, I mean, given whatever we have as a blockchain today, what kind of new applications we can have? Just be imaginative and be creative, right? Even if blockchain itself is always uh, uh, as sloppy as today, but can we still create something nice? Or maybe you have a, when we just have an abstraction of this distributed ledger, can we create something completely unimaginative before? Well, at the lower layer, actually, because of all kinds of new kind of decentralized applications, actually propose a lot of new questions to the crypto people. Here, the crypto, I mean, <laughs> the cryptography. And uh, a lot of very exciting new questions actually started to be formulated and studied in the recent crypto world as well. Just to, I mean, some, some kind of, of those questions actually were not maybe simply ignored before. Well, at the core layer is the blockchain itself, uh, is a consensus layer. And uh, that's the part um, we are going to focus today. Um, uh, again, so because there are many other layers like program analysis, game theory, even network layers. So there are many, many exciting domains in the blockchain research. So this, uh, the, the previous three layer categorization, basically my personal biased uh, uh, categorization. So the problem of consensus actually has been studied uh, in the distributed computing community for more than like 40 years. It had, had many, many kind of names like uh, Bezanian for tolerance, atomic broadcast, uh, Bezanian agreement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Probably you, you, all of you have heard of it. And today they, they essentially just Bitcoin for the first time brought it to the qualitative difference scenario that uh, it, the massive scale distributed system can be deployed in the, over the open internet. 
The actual definition of consensus actually is very simple. Basically, a bunch of internet peers, each have some input transaction, they communicate, they want to reach agreement on, uh, on the digital lock. Now, the more fancy term is called digital ledger. Right? So the, the basic uh, security property is, as you most of you probably heard of, is safety and liveness. Safety essentially says that for the two honest guys, whenever they output, they essentially output the same thing. While liveness basically said, uh, that's very intuitive definition, right? Well, when you when you try to submit the request, when you try to try to submit any like many uh, money transfer request to your bank, you want it to be processed as soon as possible. Liveness essentially said, honest guys request going to be recorded to the ledger sooner or later. So that's just the description of the definition. Well, there are many many years of research there, and um, as any secure systems. The most nature challenges, uh, we want it to be as fast as possible. Like we want to, you, you probably see sometimes in the, in the media, they claim they can process like millions and millions of TPS, which obviously is uh, crazy, but uh, that's something we want to go. On the other hand, we don't want to lose security, right? If you just want to be fast, you always have an easy thing to do, just purchase a super duper server and uh, throw everything to them. And we want to achieving this kind of seemingly antagonistic goals at the same time. And particularly, one thing related to security, um, and actually one one of very very uh, well known categorization for the consensus protocol is actually based on the what kind of network assumption they are relying on. With uh, synchronous consensus, normally assumes the underlying network can deliver all message to everyone within some known bounty. Not say like, uh, imagine uh, the, the assumption is that the network gonna be super smooth and every message gonna be delivered within three seconds to everyone. So, uh, uh, and the slightly weaker version called weakly synchronous or maybe partially synchronous, essentially they all have assumed this type of timing parameters. Well, this type of uh, consensus, actually majority of the consensus are, are this type. They are more or less okay when they are deployed in the like closed among a few data centers, right? They are well connected, they may be even physically connect connected for the conventional application of uh, backups. But as, as I briefly mentioned, so now Bitcoin for the first time brought us to the qualitative different setting in the open internet. When we talk about the communication in the internet, it might be too optimistic to assume the internet to be synchronous, right? I'm, I mean, the, the nodes could be even across continent, the delay could be very dramatically. And also sometimes because you might want connected using your phone, the, the whole scenario become much more dynamic. And what's worse is that people actually, there are a bunch of works actually show that if you just do a simple denial of service attack on a small number of nodes, the whole consensus network I get stuck. So basically just delay certain nodes to let them buy, let them run out of time to, to always trigger the timeout parameter, then the whole consensus network are stuck. So essentially we're using the terminology, we lose the liveness, right? Where I just attack three nodes, maybe make the two, 3,000 whole consensus network to get stuck. What's worse is that actually, I think last year CCS, there are two recent research also show that in many of the protocols, including Bitcoin, when they are under network attacks, they might even lose safety. So that, that means double spending might be even possible. So essentially, I mean, even though synchronous consensus, they don't claim security in the asynchronous network, right? But what's, what's serious here is that when the actual open internet indeed asynchronous, then all those popular consensus protocols might have all kinds of vulnerabilities. So this calls for like asynchronous consensus, which does not make any assumption about the underlying network, as long as the message is gonna be eventually delivered. Uh, we don't make any assumption about when the message is gonna be delivered, as long as it's gonna be sometimes. Actually, the, the most intuitive way of understanding this uh, asynchronous consensus, it looks like it's more resilient, right? It must ask much more computation, communication, et cetera, et cetera which is indeed the case, but uh, there's a little bit 
counterintuitive benefits at the same time is that actually those asynchronous consensus seemingly more resilient and more demanding, but they actually also have benefit of uh, performance. The first one is uh, a property called responsiveness because in the synchronous type protocol, normally in order to assure the safety or to make sure the network assumption hold, you probably need to set a time parameter to be large enough, right? If you want, you're very conservative, you set that to be two days. Uh, two days, sure, well, all the message can be delivered, fine. But then that means the protocol will progress. Every step need to wait every single this time parameter. So it, it won't be, well, it won't be as efficient as we like. Well, asynchronous protocols, since they don't have time parameter at all, they could uh, proceed whenever network delivers. Kind of a more uh, favorable situation. And uh, another one more benefit is if you ever really deployed uh, or implemented large scale distributed system yourself, you probably remember the nightmares when you humanly manually tune the time parameters and uh, it is sleepless nights, which is not a good memory and also kind of uh, error prone. Well, in asynchronous network, uh, asynchronous consensus, you, there's no timing parameter, right? you just uh, code whatever you like. But unfortunately, most of the platforms nowadays, most of the deployed consensus actually are still some kind of synchronous consensus. Then that means they are somehow potentially vulnerable to all those uh, asynchronous network attacks. But why is the case, right? You might wonder, is it the, the I think the situation is, is not that really they don't want to use it. The idea, the answer is fairly simple, is simply because it's hard. It's complex. And there was a hint, like back to like back to the 80s already, one of the probably the most famous result in this really computing called FLP impossibility. They already hinted the difficulty of uh, constructing asynchronous consensus. They basically said, if you want asynchronous consensus to satisfy both safety and liveness, it can never be deterministic. Even though it doesn't say asynchronous consensus is not impossible, but it hints it's complicated. And over the years, people actually indeed invest a lot of efforts, try to bypass this impossibility, designing all kinds of randomized protocols. I mean, those protocols are theoretical in nature. Uh, the complexity are normally very, very high, both communication, computation, et cetera, et cetera. And essentially none of them has ever been implemented because people don't bother. The, you know, when you do the math, it's so, so high, the complexity is too high, why bother to implement? It's very similar to the situation like in crypto, like IO. We know IO might be super useful, but if you implement today, probably not a good idea. And after the Bitcoin, right? Again, people start to, because Bitcoin now brought us to the setting of uh, open internet, people then start to seriously wonder whether this kind of asynchronous protocol can ever be practical. And uh, probably one of the most uh, notable recent result is a uh, honey badger BFT, which is also from my academic family. And they, they, they kind of implemented, they optimized a classical protocol due to Bernoulli and actually did the implementation. Show kind of promising result, but still not ready yet to, to make it real. And uh, to answer this question, we gave a more affirmative answer to this question. Yes, we can. And as you probably know, this was originally uh, Obama's presidential slogan, right? But, but we are not running presidential campaign and particularly US previous president was uh, hating science. So we want to be more rigorous. So it's, it's yes, we can, but need some efforts. Um, before we go to the detail of these number protocols, let me give a very, very high level overview of how these number protocols evolve. So the real base is uh, uh, to, to classical work. One is the due to Cassiano back to crypto zero one, that's many years back. And when they proposed one of very fundamental uh, tools called MVBA, uh, MVBA means multi-valued validated that's any agreement. Why this is uh, needed um, to make, make the, 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 the conclusion short, it's a long story, but the, to make the statement short is that asynchronous multi-valued Bezany agreement simply is impossible. Like a single shot Bezany agreement, when, when the input, everyone's input is like 
uh, not zero one is large value is impossible because it incurs exponential complexity. So people will start to thinking all kind of weaker version of a multi-valued Bessonian algorithm. Uh, this validated MVBA is one of them, which turns out to be very useful. And the other base is uh, Honey Badger. So our first starting point is called Dumbo Protocol at CCS20. And now maybe it's already two years ago, we call it the Dumbo Classic. In the sense that we kind of achieve best of both. We, we can have both communi uh, constant, uh, optimum communication at the same time have, have, has the essentially optimal running time. While previously the, the literature they, they kind of diverged into two di different directions, right? One focused on optimizing running time, one focus on optimizing communication. And uh, at the same time, we also kind of opened the box and answer one of the major problems from Kashin et al. that actually answer the open problem. We push this uh, uh, important MVB component finally to optimal. And previously, the, their communication was easily blow up. And with the, the nice thing uh, you're gonna see very soon that these two work together actually kind of uh, take us back to a new design philosophy of asynchronous consensus. With a new design philosophy at hand, then we can push forward and further reduce uh, all the remaining complex complexity and at the same time, try to squeeze the concrete parameters as much as possible. And uh, in recently, we got the, we, we changed the kind of uh, the design philosophy again, takes a holistic approach like break break all the barriers in the component and try to design a whole protocol all at once, then we can essentially leverage the, the network uh, resources to the optimal level. So we have a number NG. And uh, lastly is the last one is the last, uh, not last, the latest one called Bold Dumbo Transformer. That's also gonna appear in CCS this year in the sense that Asynchronous consensus in any way is still more complex than the synchronous type of protocol. And you're gonna see very soon that the, there's a particular serious problem of one performance metric, which is latency. So we kind of try to achieve best of both in the sense that we can finally design an optimistic type of protocol that we can have a asynchronous consensus as fast as the state of the art synchronous and the depend, uh, deterministic consensus. And today we're gonna to focus on the how we start of the whole journey and the latest one of uh, BDT. Uh, any, any questions so far? Probably just, I'm just reading out a lot of slides or just give you 10 seconds to read a lot, a lot of text. We're gonna come back to it soon. Uh, oh, 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 again, I forgot to mention, if you have any question in the middle, just feel free to interrupt me to, 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 to ask. I mean, it would be better to have an inter interactive mode in, in better than to be like one direction of Okay, so let's uh, start the actual technical discussion. So what we, uh, first the, the assumption we, we, the whole setting, let's try to be on the same page is we talk about permission, the consensus in the sense that we have PKI already set up. Well, well this could be essentially the same setup as a conventional BFT or in the most of the proof stake protocols. Once you have the stake set up, then we, we, we essentially have the PKI ready, right? So first, uh, the major insight from the recent Honey Badger BFT is that uh, because they want to reduce communication, right? So essentially they consider some other type of consensus protocol in this called asynchronous common subset. So if you remember the original or maybe the classical definition of Bessonian agreement is everyone have one input transaction, they communicate, then they're gonna output one single value, right? So that's the classical definition. So instead of outputting one, uh, Honey Badger, they basically ask, why not just output a lot, right? So they ask, uh, output a common subset. As long as uh, they are the same, we, we can output the whole subset of it. So it's, it's very easy to see this is gonna be better for batching and uh, increase the, like amortized communication in, in a nice way. And one more nice observation is that this seemingly uh, powerful primitive actually can be built from the simplest possible asynchronous consensus, which is the binary version of it. So binary version essentially says everyone's input is zero and one. It's called ABA, like that's easy to understand, right? And if we peel off all the unnecessary difficulty or complexity of Honey Badger BFT, 
if you actually go read the paper, it's quite complex. But if you decouple it, like throw away all the, <laughs> all the complexity things, the, the, the backbone of it actually is fairly simple. It, particularly if we focus on the common subset part already, the backbone of the, the structure is really simple. So basically the, the intuition is every party has an input transaction, right? Just broadcast his value to everyone while some uh, component called reliable broadcast. So here, oh, it seems like that, sure. So here RBC basically means reliable broadcast, a special type of broadcast primitive. In the, they can, they have a nice property to guarantee that as long as one on a two honest guy output, they're gonna output the same. So agreement always gonna be guaranteed, uh, even if the, the sender is malicious. So basically sender can never send A to node one, B to node B. Um, but the first phase just essentially everyone broadcast to everyone, right? And that's easy to understand. Then the second phase, essentially they use another primitive uh, as I just mentioned, the binary version is a binary Bessonian agreement, ABA here means. So essentially every single instance means they all of them come to vote. They use this binary Bessonian agreement to vote. Should we output transaction one? Should we output transaction two? Should I output transaction three? Just do this protocol instance one by one. So you can see that when, when they execute enough uh, binary agreement, if the binary agreement output is one, that means they all, the honest guy all agree to output one, then they just output, just wait until output this particular value. So the whole structure is fairly easy, right? Basically the first phase broadcast, everyone broadcast to everyone. Second phase is let's come together to jointly vote. Should we output the, the first guy's input, second guy's input, uh, third guy's input, that's it. Uh, any question here? So far, so good, right? Also, this natural, intuitive, and simple. So then what's wrong with it, right? So since we said we want to push it to make it more real, first, let's see why it's not real yet, right? Uh, the, the first thing we will set up to do is try to identify what's the major bottleneck of this seemingly very simple structure. Well, the, the intuition comes from FLP impossibility again. Since there's no, deterministic asynchronous consensus protocol, while even the binary agreement still a consensus protocol. So all those binary agreement also has to be randomized. Essentially on the second voting phase, all the players needs to jointly or concurrently running a large number of randomized protocols. Well, randomized pro protocol, nothing wrong with them, but there's one um, weakness or something in sense on how to say, maybe feature of randomized protocol is that since they are randomized, they could be terminating at 10 rounds. They could also be terminating at hundred rounds. So everything is with a probability, right? And particularly when you concurrently run large number of randomized protocols, the whole procedure, the whole second phase procedure only terminate at the slow instance instance. And if you run the number of instances uh, more than enough, um, the number of instances is large enough, you know for sure, there must be a small, a, a slow instance, essentially with a large number of runs. If you do the calculation, actually, the, the total number of runs indeed depend on the number of instances gonna be running. So, and let's, that's just our simple mathematical intuition, right? And we also just did the experiment to verify this. And the, the experimental result actually not only validate our conjecture, but also give us a um, much better like how, understanding of the overall complexity in the sense that, so here the blue column is the cost of the binary agreement phase. Essentially, if you remember like the RBC phase and ABA phase. So the blue column is actually the, just running the voting procedure while the red column is the broadcast phase. So if you look at this picture, besides like you are, you are convinced that the, the complexity mostly come from here, but also if you see the numbers, right? We can see a very easy way forward. This binary agreement phase not only is slow, they are dominatingly slow. They take more, almost like 95% of the time. Actually, this is only, we only did experiment and to the, is very small scale, right? The N gets larger and larger, the portion gonna be larger and larger and larger. 
So essentially, for next step, give us very easy instruction. Just cut off this blue, uh, blue column, then we are done. <laughs> we can claim victory easily. And indeed, that's what we did. Um, so, so this picture gave us a very, very strong intuition that we want to push the number of a binary agreement, essentially the randomized instance, as much as possible, right? To, to make, essentially minimize the use of this binary voting procedure. But if we look at the honey badger backbone again, it looks like uh, the, the, the binary agreement is kind of needed in the sense that because you, you use the binary agreement as a voting procedure, right? To vote for every single instances. But voting is needed. And um, any source is a uh, voting like this needed. So we know that if you vote one by one, easy intuitive, but gonna be slow, right? Then the intuition is fairly simple, is can we make the voting procedure more effective? Instead of voting one by one, can we vote all at once? So that's basically our intuition. And uh, oh, I skipped the number one, there was a like intermediate step might be easier to understand. I directly jumped to the final protocol, but actually the final protocol is gonna be surprisingly simple. If you if you <laughs> look back, super simple, and so let's just look at walk through the whole process, uh, the structure again. So after the reliable broadcast phase, everyone broadcast everyone, right? After a while, actually in every single node, they already have a bunch of input at hand. So for node one, I already received the transaction one, three, four, ten, right? So everyone already have a vector values at hand. So then it's naturally to ask, can we make a voting procedure that actually just to determine whether should we output the vector or maybe essentially the intermediate value at everyone's hand, at the hand, right? So essentially we just need to, essentially just uh, instead of voting for one value, we vote for one vector. But in order to vote for one vector, essentially we vote for one guy, right? So every one of them have a vector. We just need to decide, should we output the vector at player three? That's what we need to do. And this is also why the MVB protocol come into play. Remember that now the input is not, so previously uh, the ABA input, oh, sorry. So here, uh, here everyone, the input, when they run the binary agreement, they just input zero one, right? Yes or no on this uh, each individual transaction. Now is, they will do the multi uh, the MVB protocol in the sense that because everyone's input is gonna be a vector of values instead of just one yes or no. And since the general multi-value BA is impossible in the asynchronous setting, naturally we come to consider this MVB protocol. And the, the, the key idea is that we need, so this MVB basically uh, is weaker in the sense that the output could coming from a potentially malicious guy, a malicious guy's input. So it could be that we choose a player three and player three is actually malicious. He may not be responsive, right? But the, the guarantee of this validated thing is that this value at least satisfy a certain predicate, whatever public is specified. So what we need to do here is kind of design a predicate in the way that anyone, any honest guy, if they output this particular vector, and everyone else would output the same vector. We need to guarantee the safety, right? Then that, that's actually the, the, the key observation we need to design is predicate. Well, how do we design is predicate? It's also extre extremely simple. As long as we are guaranteed that each of, each of the input value in the vector is already received by enough honest guys, then we are kind of confident because the reliable broadcast kind of guarantees as long as one honest guy output this value, everyone will eventually output this. So what we do, basically we augment the reliable broadcast phase with a short succinct proof in the sense that the proof, every single transaction, we're gonna attach a short proof to claim this transaction already being received by enough people. Well, how do we do this proof? It's extremely simple and very simple and useful crypto tool, threshold signature. And uh, yeah, once we have the proof, then we 
pass the 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 vector together attached with the proof into MVBA, and the predicate basically just examine whether the proof is valid or not. Because if the proof, proof is valid, that means each transaction of all the uh, in the in the vector have already been received by enough honest guy. Then if you determine to output this vector, everyone gonna be eventually output the same value because the guarantee of the reliable broadcast property. One thing I would like to note here is that actually this MVBA protocol was explicitly dis, uh, disregarded in the Honey Badger work because they consider MVBA might blow up the whole communication. Well, it's indeed the case when the input size is very large. But if we look at the, the whole protocol structure careful again, well, we don't really have to throw all the data, like the, the data vector as the MVB input. Because when, when out, uh, after the broadcast phase, everyone indeed have a value, right? But they also will, they have the short proof and the index. What we really do is actually just throw the index together with the succinct proof as the input to invoke MVB so that we can actually completely avoid the communication blow up. The nice thing about this is that actually this very similar to one of very, one of probably most widely used the cryptographic paradigm. Um, anyone see the similarity? So we have a component which potentially might be very heavy blow up communication, but at the end we, we use this heavy stuff for efficiency. Any thoughts? So this is actually very similar to one, one of the probably most widely used crypto paradigm. <laughs> it's like hybrid encryption. Right? Well, in hybrid encryption, we use public encryption to encrypt actually a short key. We, we never use public encryption to short, encrypt a movie, right? They're gonna be take you a whole day. But the, the actual data load are gonna be used as symmetric encryption. But this is used the other way around. Uh, we have a more flexible component, which is heavy, but we invoke them with a very, very small input before we do a careful pre-processing of it. It is not exactly match, but share a lot of similarity to it. So that's why I see if you look back at it, it's actually surprisingly simple. I don't know why it take people so many times didn't figure out this. And people even like explicitly disabandon MVBA as a nice component. So yeah, let, 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 uh, and also the MVB protocol because they only just uh, need to choose one guy, right? So essentially they just need to run the binary agreement at most three or two or three times as long as they hit the one honest guy. Uh, so we did the experiment again to, to test. Well, indeed uh, uh, it kind of confirmed our design philosophy. So here, is the basic latency, the honey badger, when the number of nodes gets larger and larger, then the latency gonna get much, much larger. While the Dumbo protocol, is still get larger, but the slowly get larger. While for throughput, similarly, a honey badger gonna easily get stuck just because of the protocol overhead itself. While we can continue increase the, the, the batch size to make the throughput larger and larger. And uh, this numbers, uh, does not matter much. And uh, we also decoupled uh, each component again. And indeed, when the, we see when the number of binary agreement instances is smaller, the, the chances you got stuck also get much smaller, right? This, this original one, you always, you have very large chance to get stuck at slow instances. So, okay. So I guess that the actual, the, 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 these numbers does not matter too much. I think the, the most interesting message of this Dumbo classic protocol is the sense that we actually, we actually can rec reclaim the glory of this uh, MVB protocol as right the designing philosophy in the sense that we want to construct the consensus, right? Atomic broadcast in the sense that, and we know that they, the common subset is a good uh, intermediate abstraction. And uh, there are two well-known classical passes the first one is actually due to back to Ben Or at all, back to the 80s, and was adopted by Honey Badger. And the MVBA pass was uh, was proposed by Kashin at all. And uh, they can even have a different type of MVBA. But previously, when they use it, using a way to make a communication blow up. 
And the Honey Badger explicitly abandoned MVPA because MVPA communication blow up is too much. But at, at the cost that they're gonna incur a large uh, large rounds, large number of rounds. So what we essentially show that we can, despite the underlying component, have the risk of blowing up communication. If you do it carefully, then we can actually make the end result much, much better. And we also open the box of uh, this MVP. Actually, we see, at least in theory, the communication blow up might not be necessary. And uh, yeah, so the first, to conclude the first part of the talk, uh, at least we, we reclaim the glory of the new, uh, the MVB protocol as the right way to constructing practical asynchronous consensus. And uh, oh, that's, maybe you cannot skip this part. So to then, uh, are, we, are we done? <laughs> Since we, we, we have a honey badger is good, we have a drama dramatically improved efficiency, looks great, number are good, even comparable to, to the, to the popular synchronous consensus close. But if we look at the, but actually, unfortunately, the fact is that if we only consider throughput or consider the scale is small. Why is the case? If we look at this uh, table again, despite that comparing with Honey Badger, the, the, the latency uh, Dumbo protocol is slower in a slow pace, right? But the, if we change the reference point, if we compare to deterministic protocol like host up, well, this, this is a very small slope becomes <laughs> dramatically different. Well, the, the, essentially the, the deterministic protocol, however you scale, the latency is kind of essentially stable. It's very, very small at the, just a, at the most a few seconds. While if you see even the slope here is small, but if you take it out, change the reference, it's dramatically different, right? The, it's still at the, uh, a few dozen of seconds. So let, let, let's know something uh, very favorable at the moment. So that's another issue we want to handle. And, but this essentially brings, up a, brings us a more fundamental question. If we want to use our like host app or this, popular deterministic protocol or PPFT, right? This deterministic uh, synchronous protocols, they are indeed fast, but uh, they are not, they have no guarantee of security in the asynchronous network, particularly the open internet, right? Especially when they are under a network attacks. But if we want to really deploy these randomized protocols, they are robust, true, but they are still quite slow, right? As we see in the picture. Essentially we are in the, facing a, a dilemma here. Are we choose security or are we going to just uh, want to be fast? Forget about security. So by security, do you mean uh, the agreement our liveness? Yeah, means? either agreement or liveness, yeah. Right, so what would be the, just let's say for host stuff or- Ah, okay, so host stuff definitely there's no liveness for sure. Mm -hmm. And because any leader based protocol, you can simply delay the leader, right? But uh, in, in, at least the many protocols like Bitcoin, right? People already show in last year's CCS, you can even find attacks to cause the safety issues. Both yeah. are possible. Right. But just in terms of the, the permission um, uh -huh. protocols. Uh -huh. So normally the liveness is the issue. Then, um, but let, let's say in comparison between, for example, host stuff like protocols, and also the uh, asynchronous, uh, like asynchronous BFT protocols. Um, so for how stuff like protocols, the safety can still be guaranteed uh, when the network. Yeah, yeah how stuff, I, can, I think safety is fine because they still yeah. use the current. Then yeah. the only problem is the, the liveness. Yeah. However, um, if the network, let's say is very unstable, so there will be no progress to be made yeah. uh, for how stuff like protocols. Uh, but with asynchronous BFT, uh, there is still a kind of a longer latency, right? In, uh, yeah. in terms yeah, of yeah. the network uh, disruption, for example. So what what exactly is the, the the delta between these two protocols in terms of the the performance in this oh, case? Oh, okay. 
So, but if if we look at the whole stuff, I mean, if we really look at adversarial network, like adversary actually determining the the the, the timing parameters, right? Like de de determining the the network delay. Actually, we can make hot stuff stuck forever. Your host stuff always have a like when you change rot rotating the leaders, you have a time map, time map parameters. You need to switch next one, right? So I always delay the leader until before he finish to become a new leader. Then gonna be switched again. So essentially, host stuff gonna be stuck forever. While asynchronous protocol, even the network is bad as long as you have some progress, you, you still slowly progress forward. Just depending on how network is it now, as long as you deliver, right? So let, that's the Key difference. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any other question? Okay. So, but we cryptographers are, are, are very, uh, we, we, we're not easy to buy. We, we have to make a choice. We want to get the best of both. So that's what we do all the time, right? And uh, basically, we want to ask the question can we get the both? Can we get a protocol as robust as a, essentially, can we get an asynchronous protocol? but still as fast as deterministic protocols. But there's one fundamental reason that we have to use randomness, right? Sometimes randomness might incur unpredictable latency. Kind of, uh, we are in this dilemma, but we don't want to make a choice. Well, the idea is actually, the rough idea is actually very simple, even though it's not, I, not exactly the ideal situation, but we kind of approximate it. It's something called optimistic asynchronous protocol. What does that mean? So we can always run something called fastlane, which is deterministic, super fast, super super fast protocol. But whenever something something happens, whenever some issue happens, then we start to fall back to a safe, more robust protocol called asynchronous fallback or maybe even view change. And the the rationale is actually fairly simple, right? The real world network cannot be stuck forever, right? Normally it might be smooth for quite some time, then have some busy hours, then maybe smooth for quite some time. So as so the intuition is, can we harvest all the efficiency of the smooth period and only take care of security only when network gets bad or maybe under attacks? And the, 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 the theory behind it actually was proposed, uh, was studied actually a long time ago by Gustav Shup and Ramzami and Kashim, like again, 20 years back. But the, the idea is very simple, right? But the, to make it work in asynchronous network turns out to be quite involved. Uh, let me just give you a very, very quick overview of it. So essentially the fast lane is very simple, just we continuously broadcast or continuously multicast. That's good enough. Because optimistic is essentially we assume the leader is good, network is good, right? Whenever those things are good, everything's easy. But when things happen, or maybe here now they have a certain, they have a time parameter consider attack is happening, then everyone gonna be kind of shout out to the peers, right? We have some problem, we might need to fall back. And when enough people start to complain, then they jointly run this kind of fallback protocol. What, what, what do they exactly need to do? The reason is that maybe Jiang Shan is already progressing to 100, uh, the 100 block, while I'm only at the block 10. So we have a mismatch, right? So the fallback protocol is at least in, let all of us to agree where to restart the protocol. Where do we actually enter the asynchronous path? But if we think more carefully again, I mentioned earlier in the, in the, in the talk, multi-valued Bethany agreement in the asynchronous setting is actually impossible because they incur exponentially large communication. Well, we, when we want to decide where to fall back, the input size is already not small, right? Like index like could be a hundred, could be 10. It's definitely not zero one, right? It, it, it kind of we're already in, in a very dangerous setting of the impossibility edge. And, and then once they decide they fall, to fall back, then they basically can, everyone catch up and then make progress. Sir, I, I just wonder if the normal checkpointing would help here. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, checkpointing definitely help. Uh, at least for histories, but then for the next before checkpointing, and we still need to do this, right? Before next checkpoint. Right? So I guess now asynchronous one. 
Ah, that's a very good question. That's a very, very good question. So in the, actually in the worst case, in the extreme case, this protocol might be even worse than just running the asynchronous protocol as it is, right? Because you might keep fall back running again, keep fall back. But the, 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 the aim of this protocol is kind of for real world uh, network. So you, you still have sufficiently long, like synchronous phase, then you can make fast progress for quite some time, then, then do a slow change once. At least the, the waste should not be should be compensated by the fast fast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I also ask a question? Ah, sure. Yeah, so to decide where to fall back, can you do something like, I don't know, one guy says, let's say zero, one other guy says, I don't know, a hundred. Uh -huh. And then you say, shall we move to between zero to 50 or 50 to 100? Uh -huh. So you decide on that first. Oh, you mean do binary? Then, uh, you, can, you can have to do a binary. Search, yeah. uh, that's a very nice idea. Uh, but but it, it, however you do, just look at it as a black box. So you have everyone have an input like as an index and uh, like what you describe essentially is a potential protocol, right? This block box at the end of the day, like an output index, that's gonna be the index we're gonna agree, right? Mm -hmm. So this component looks like a multi-valued uh, Bethany agreement already, right? Even though you, you yeah. maybe you describe something already working, but the... <laughs> Um, yeah, but 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 as a block as a box is is much more complex than binary version of it as it is, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, actually, the the two earlier the classical work. Uh, other question? Ah, two classical works indeed find a cl very clever way, clever way to leveraging this a weaker validated Bethany agreement instead of running into the dead end dead loop of a multi valued Bethany agreement. They carefully designed the the predicate in a way that essentially they throw all the history into this uh, multi-valued uh, validated Bessonian agreement, as long as they just output essentially the largest common set in some way. Um, yeah, if you're interested in details, you definitely can check the, the layout papers, but very smart ideas. But smart idea come at a, comes at a price. So, Despite the many years progress of this MVP, MVBA protocol, they're still very complex. It's not something you don't you want to see now, and also not something I want to explain now. So when you use this component and use a large size input, the all the weakness start to appear because it, it's going to really incur communication blow up. Uh, well, as I just briefly mentioned in the classical work, they basically throw all the current transcript as input into this. Uh, MVBA protocol, then the communication definitely going to be blow up. So, but this, this just occurs, uh, incurs theoretical drawbacks, but, it, but in order to make it actually useful, that's actually re very relevant to Peter's question. We want to make this uh, optimistic protocol useful, right? That means the, the fast lane, we want to make it as much as possible. And the, the slow pass, we want to make it uh, as small, as, as less costly as possible, right? But look at one possibility. If the slow pass is too slow, like fallback is too slow, one single fallback may waste a lot of fast pass. So in the sense that even if the network is stable, actually majority of the time, if the slow pass is too, too slow, right? Then you can do a easy calculation that maybe you waste too much of this uh, optimistic blocks. Then the whole, what's the point of having this, uh, two type of hybrid protocol. Why not just run the asynchronous, asynchronous protocol by itself? So the key idea is that we really need this, uh, oh, maybe I kind of forgot to mention the name. So the pace synchronization essentially de determine where we're gonna uh, fall back and the real pessimistic path just for, to run the full, full scale, the asynchronous consensus to catch up. We, we really need uh, like a super light pace synchronization. Basically that step, we cannot throw everything to the MVBA to make it super complex. And that's why we called the, we introduced this new framework called Bold Number Transformer. And uh, well, the first observation is actually easy. So we, we essentially have two issues to conquer, right? First is the, the pessimistic path, the asynchronous path itself. Then we can replace the state of the art asynchronous protocol, for example, number two. But what's, there's another, major challenge is for the pace synchronization during fallback, essentially determine where we're gonna restart the protocol in this uh, pessimistic case. And uh, what we do is we propose a new type of abstraction in the sense that 
the fast thing going to be still fast, but a little bit more powerful. But the 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 pace synchronization going to be having a cheapest possible asynchronous protocol. I'm going to leave a question here. What could be the cheapest possible asynchronous a consensus protocol for pace synchronization? So you, you either you can answer me now, or maybe you, you can easily get the answer like after one or two slides. Question? Ah, okay, <laughs> okay. So that's basically what we're gonna do. Essentially, we want to make the framework more fine grain. Just add a little bit on the fast pass, but uh, gain a lot on the on the pace synchronization. So we call this a new abstraction of fast. Let me see how many time we have. Oh, I should probably quickly wrap up. Uh, um, five, 10 minutes. Mm. Okay, I'll try to wrap up soon. Um, so we propose a new thing called the notarizable uh, weak atomic broadcast. Uh, you don't need to remember the name. So the, the key idea is that this is gonna be of a handicapped version of it. So essentially it only in the optimistic case, this type of thing is gonna be full fledged uh, like atomic broadcast. It, it's gonna be working, it's gonna have guarantee. But if the protocol, if the network is asynchronous, there's no guarantee, it's just handicapped. But only one new guarantee we propose is called a notarizability. Essentially, is anyone output one single block with some kind of certificate, there must be enough people already output a certificate in the previous block. That's the thing we call notarizability. That's the only property we, 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 we ask. And this property actually is extremely simple to get. And if you look at the actual instantiation, it's super simple. Essentially, it's, a, it's still a multicast protocol with one simple proof. What's the proof again? Threshold signature, like uh, because enough people have already received the previous one, that I'm only, only to going to output the this one. Very simple. Essentially, we just upgrade the. Uh, not exactly. Pace sync is more complicated in the sense that someone might be at block five but you might be at block 100. We need to find a middle ground to, to decide where we restart. And uh, yeah, so the, 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 the boat itself, the construction itself is not interesting at all. It, it's super simple. The only interesting thing is um, it have a one new property called notarizability, but why is interesting gonna be, it's not even showing here. It's gonna be see very soon. The, the real key point is that this, New property is super easy to get, essentially have no overhead, but gonna enable the asynchronous pace synchronization we call transformer, the cheapest possible. Do you get um, a better idea what could be the cheapest possible pace synchronization? Someone want to try now? And if you don't try now, the answer gonna be revealed very soon. Um, Let's just try to walk through the whole whole protocol a little bit. Maybe you can easy to see. So what what do we do? I mean, when we get stuck, right? We have a time parameter. Let let's say after uh, thirty seconds or maybe two minutes, or I don't have any progress. I just broadcast everyone. I'm stuck. Simple, right? Just I broadcast my latest block. I'm stuck. And if you if I receive enough, if you got everyone doing this, right? If if many people got stuck, essentially everyone is broadcast this message. Then other people will eventually receive enough complaints. Right, then I know I, I should enter the fallback mechanism now. And just I just take the largest index as my input to enter the fallback mechanism. Uh, so far, so good, simple. And um, maybe I skip this to subtleties. And what's really interesting here is how does this very simple motorizability property to make this fallback procedure much simpler and the uh, we can even push to the extreme. Essentially, we can use conceptually the minimal of asynchronous uh, of, of pace synchronization. Uh, you have a question? Okay. Or you want to try the answer of what is the cheapest one? Or make a guess. Sorry? Ah, yeah, exactly. That's the answer. But the uh, 
but there's a mismatch yet, right? Uh, as we just said, the input of Zhangshan could be 100, my input could be five. And we want to kind of, it's obviously a multi-value instance, but we cannot just use one single binary agreement to make this work. There's a mismatch here, right? So we need to do a little bit of work, but work is not on the protocol, but on actually just the analysis. We will just need to guarantee this indeed works. So we can try to see what's the pattern of this uh, honest uh, nodes. Uh, actually, all the mathematics involved here is really high school or maybe even, even earlier math. So there's nothing complex as a, as a lattice or whatever. But the, the simple observation actually is good enough to enable us to, to squeeze this gap. Um, so let, let's just imagine when everyone entered the, uh, the transformer, so that is the largest honest of index, right? So someone like Jiangshan is uh, 100, Joseph at the 20, I'm at five. But even though I don't know what is largest one, but there exists the largest one, right? Let's assume it's V. So I was just thinking that if we simply agree on the largest one, would that also require the resynchronization of all the slower nodes to, to resynchronize all the states? Or do we consider that the the consensus instance are fairly independent. Um, Namely, you know, uh, the, the future decision is not, let's say, stateful. So which uh, case it, are we considering? It is not stateful. And first of all, we actually, no one knows what is the largest uh, index. And actually the output, not necessarily the largest in index. We don't know. We just uh, assume there exists one, right? I, we're, we're trying to run a protocol, actually just one single binary agreement protocol to figure out something. And this thing not necessary is the largest one. You're gonna see very, very soon. The, the, the real interesting part is using really elementary math to just figure out the pattern of this input. The, the pattern actually already is very nicely behavior already. So far we're on the same page, right? There exists a large index V, so we don't know what it is, but there exists. I'm going to make a few claims. Uh, first claim is, Suppose, but every honest uh, input have to be at least V minus one. That's my first claim. Well, that's actually not very hard because, because of the notarizability property, right? Anyone output a block at the V because the, this guy have it. So at least a plus one enough good node already output the V minus one, right? Let's call the guy who have V minus one as a set good. And also, how do we enter this transformer? We said we take enough complaints, right? Enough complaints actually contains a set of uh, indexes and the index size actually is two F plus one. Oh, sorry, the F is the number of 40 nodes. The total nodes is like three F plus one. This is the conventional setup. And then the, the most challenging <laughs> mathematical thing come into play is the, the pigeonhole principle. This set gonna be intersect. So that means everyone's complaint set gonna contain at least one have V minus one. And we said, everyone gonna take the largest index from the complaints as his input, right? So the first cl claim is very easy to see, even though I don't know what's the largest one, but definitely every honest guy's input is at least V minus one because he has C something in his complaint set as V minus one, clear? Then my second claim is even easier. And no one can complain with index too large. Well, this is even more straightforward, right? If you can, that means we will apply notarizability again. That means at least enough people already received V plus one. Then that means directly contradict, contradict with our uh, assumption, right? We said the honest guy is, uh, is uh, the largest one is V. But because someone can, complain at V plus bigger than V plus one, that means he has a valid uh, certificate in V plus one, notarizability come into play again. Just immediate the contradiction. So just after this two step of very simple analysis, like elementary mathematics, we get the kind of narrowed all the possible input values from originally like all possible integer down to the three numbers, right? V minus one, V and V plus one. That, but we can actually do even better. We can keep pushing and uh, using similar, uh, similar ideas to make further complaints 
uh, claims, for example, we, we can easily claim that no one can claim, uh, if no malicious node claim at v plus one, then no one gonna claim at v plus one. This is like a, really like a, I said nothing, right? Because <laughs> these two things are identical, right? And then I we rule out one possibility again. Then similarly, if no malicious, uh, if one malicious node complain at v plus one, then then every honest node will apply uh, complain complain at v. Similarly, applying the the notarizability argument as before. So what do we have? Like after just a simple two minutes checking, essentially every honest guy's input could only be either v minus one or v or v v plus one. So essentially, for all the honest guy, their input can only be possible to add have two very close values. They cannot be too far away, essentially. So what's the difficulty of this asynchronous phase synchronization is that because the range of input is so large that may push us to the boundary of impossibility. But in reality, actually, if we check very carefully and uh, leveraging this simple notarizability property that we can kind of guarantee everyone's progress kind of more or less similar. So we don't need to worry too much about large uh, range of input index. Now come back to um, Mohammed's point, like how do we use binary agreement? We really just use it as it is a one single instance of binary agreement. What do we do? Well, two values, not exactly binary, but you can always do modular too, right? <laughs> Easy, you, you get, essentially you, you just run a binary agreement just at once. So everyone have an in index as input, throw into it, modular two, throw into it and run a binary agreement, done. If you get one, then do V plus one, you get zero, just whatever input you have, that's the output. And this have no guarantee on is the largest one or not, right? Could be V minus one, or also possible. And there are also further subtleties. Maybe I should uh, skip, consider the time. Oh, really? Yeah, some subtleties we can take care of and uh, if you are interested, we can definitely talk more offline and, uh, or maybe you can check the paper. And uh, to have a quick summary, the whole board dumbo transformer protocol, the, the framework, essentially the big idea, uh, the, the basic idea is we want to have a kind of handicapped version of a uh, fast lane but this handicapped version still have some very simple property, does not in influence efficiency, but enable us to carefully examine the pattern of, uh, of the asynchronous setting, kind of guarantees all the nodes to pro progress in a similar pace in the way that we prepare everyone, even in the worst case to fall back, then they can just use the simplest possible asynchronous phase synchronization, just a binary uh, agreement. And since this is a really generic instance, a generic framework, whenever you have better binary agreement, we can just plug in. Whenever we have even better uh, asynchronous protocol, we can plug in. And also there's one uh, simple optimization. We can even skip the pessimistic pass completely if there's some condition happens, but there's also some other details. Uh, if you're interested, we can talk more offline. And uh, yeah, experiment probably just, skip and uh, you can see it <laughs> because we're gonna get latency as close as to the like here, uh, not throughput, latency. Yeah, so this is the asynchronous protocol while these are the deterministic ones and this BDT. So we're kind of in the line with them and the throughput. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let me summarize. So. Uh, asynchronous protocol, this, I mean, actually recently there are many, many very, very exciting progress in the asynchronous consensus actually from various teams from like a, a running EIC team, a Facebook team and a, a few others. But uh, essentially we're trying to walk through the jungle of the complex <laughs> asynchronous protocols. And uh, the Honey Major give us a very nice instance we can actually run. It is not something we always have to crawl, crawl but we can run. But the, the Dumbo classic protocol I'm trying to convey that flying might be at least faster than running. And with BDT, we, we can hope to make even asynchronous protocol flashing fast. Well, the one takeaway message is that despite the, the, the structure of this asynchronous protocol is super, super intuitive, like just broadcast and agree, right? Binary agreement essentially is kind of voting and agree procedure, right? The structure seems so simple, 
but still there are dramatic space to improve. Actually, we already see like a dozens of paper to optimizing all kinds of different ways. And surprisingly, we can often bring even asynchronous, uh, no, asymptotic improvement. Uh, that what, uh, was a little bit surprising before. Even though the, 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 the intuition is simple, but in asynchronous setting, everything is much more complicated. So there are many rooms for, for, for us to push forward. And now we are really to the edge of uh, deploying it. And uh, the performance now is, the number at least is very good. But the, then, then the questions are also kind of, we are pushed to the extreme for both concrete optimization and also more fundamental theoretical questions. For example, for the practical wise, like we still have all kinds of different metrics to, to balance, to find the best trade-offs, right? And uh, you have communication, computation, runs, and trusted setup, et cetera, et cetera. Can we find the best trade-off? Or uh, I doubt we can have the best, like every single metric for all, but uh, we may consider different type of set uh, trade-offs. But let, more theoretically, that's also a very interesting question is that, do we really have an inherent gap between asynchronous protocol and the deterministic protocols. Even though there's randomness involved, but for the rounds, now the lower bound is far from being matched, I guess. The, the lower bound in the asynchronous protocol is still two or three, essentially doesn't tell us much information, right? So the, the, the gap is large. So do we, can we get, make the bound to meet the performance, the construction, or do we get the construction to meet the bound? I, my personal guess is probably somewhere in the middle, but we don't have a good understanding of the lower bound yet. And uh, yeah, what if you want to be even more ambitious? There are many, many exciting questions. So if you are interested, definitely welcome everyone to, to take a look at it, redesign this part and redesign, maybe redesign new crypto component, make it uh, super nice. And uh, yeah, welcome to Sydney to visit me and uh, see you guys there too. Uh, ah, okay, thanks, I'm uh, happy to take questions. Um, thank you very much, Kian, for your very interesting talk. Uh, I think in order not to miss the lunch, uh, <laughs> we might need to skip the questions here. So I think everyone here can stay, and yeah, we want you, you can continue the discussion offline. And I don't think there are any questions from the Zoom. So yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in, and thank you, Kian, for your very interesting talk. Sure. Uh, so we will end the session here. Thanks. Thanks.